Welcome back to AI 101. This month we are talking about a task that is particularly relevant to some current events. Outbreak prediction. Is this AI? Depends on who you're asking, but one of the reasons why I changed the name of my channel was to give me more leeway to doing topics like this that don't really fit inside the scope of what's called AI. So we're just gonna go with it. If you're new to my channel, hi, I'm Jordan, and if you want to learn more about AI and machine learning, you can check out the rest of my AI 101 series. Also, if you like this video and you want to let me know that, you can smash that like button and subscribe to my channel. Many of us have probably been working from home for the past couple days, so I probably don't need to justify why outbreak prediction is an important task to focus on in data science. And it's not something that's new to our current pandemic. There have been disease outbreaks in the past and there will be in the future. So being able to forecast how severe they are and how they might spread is really important to helping the healthcare system prepare. It's also important because it can help people understand why certain preventative measures are taken in the face of a pandemic. Right now, we're hearing a lot about social distancing to flatten the curve. And so today's tutorial is actually going to show you how to make those graphs that show you why social distancing is so important. Two quick disclaimers before we get into the code. First, I am neither a doctor nor an epidemiologist. So if you feel sick, if you need medical advice, please seek out expert advice. Second, the information in this video is up to date as of March 20th, 2020. So things may or may not have changed between now and when you see this video. As usual, we're using Google Collab notebooks, which I'll put up up here in a second to walk you through these examples. And if you have any questions about how to use them, feel free to let me know in the comments. So we're gonna start by loading in the data and making it a little bit easier to visualize in a graph. This data set is originally from the European CDC, but has been collected and organized by a group called Our World is Data into a format that's a bit easier to deal with on a computer. We're pulling the data off of the website itself, which is updated at 10 a.m. every day. So every time you run this block of code, it will be pulling the most recent file with the most up-to-date information. Once we have the data loaded, we want to collect a list of the countries that we're representing in this data. This is to make it easier to look at the data by country or by the whole world, because that is an option, because otherwise it's all in one long list of information and that can be difficult to parse. So for now, we're going to focus on the United States, but in this, I print out the list of the countries at the bottom of this code block. So you can flip through the whole list and see which countries you want to visualize if you want to see something other than the United States. And then we can start looking at our data. First, I'm plotting the newly reported cases and deaths for each day. So this is in a day, how many people newly have been diagnosed with coronavirus and how many of those people who have been diagnosed have died. In the second plot, we focus on the total number of cases. So you can think of this plot as a sum of the cases over the days leading up to that point. So now that we can see the data in the past, we want to see what this data might look like in the future. How might the number of new cases change each day? We can already see that this pattern follows a curve of exponential growth, so we're going to try to fit a new formula to predict these future data. In general, I'm not going to get too into the math in this video, so if you want a deeper explanation of that, you should check out Grant Sanders' video on exponential growth in pandemics for a really good explanation mathematically as to how this works. So in order to find an equation that fits the exponential growth of this outbreak, we're gonna focus on the new cases. There's a reason for that, and I explain a little bit more about that in the collab notebook, so if you're curious, you can check there. To create our exponential formula, we're going to start by actually taking the natural log of this data. Because we think that the data is exponential, this should turn our data set into a relatively flat line, something that we can more easily calculate the slope of. And as you can see in the first graph, that's actually true. That's what happens. In the initial days, because there are no new cases, we see pretty much a flat line, and then you see a sharply sloped line once we start to see new cases grow. We can find the slope of this line using a linear regression. In this case, I'm using scikit-learn, which is a fairly common toolbox for data science and machine learning to find the slope of that curve. You'll note that I'm only focusing on a certain region of the data. That's because that first part of the data isn't actually particularly useful to us right now. We want to model this starting with the first day where there are known cases and go from there. Now that we have the slope of this equation, what we want to know is how many cases will there be in the next 10 days. So we have the first 81 days here and we're going to look through day 90. To do this, we just multiply the dates themselves, the number of days, 
by that slope that we originally found from the linear regression. That will give us the log of the number of actual cases, which continues that straight line from the first plot. If we want the actual number of cases, we take the exponent of that. And you can see from the second plot that we get a curve that fits the last 20 days where you start seeing that real exponential growth very well, and then continues to grow exponentially from there. Now, this probably doesn't look great because what it does tell us is that 10 days from now, we're going to have about 70,000 cases in the United States. And keep in mind that the cases that we're reporting from this data are the cases of people who have tested positive, who have received a test in the United States, which has a huge shortage of tests right now, so we're probably undercounting by a lot. That'll actually be important to think about if you run this code in the future, because at some point there's going to be a day or several days where in the United States data, the number of new cases skyrockets, and the model may not be able to account for that so well. So exponential growth is a useful model to look at how a disease will spread if left unattended, but it has some significant shortfalls. First of all, there are only so many people in the world. This curve assumes that it will just keep going forever, but eventually the disease will run out of people to infect. In other words, at some point this curve has to plateau because there's just no more people and everyone has it. Second of all, people get better. Most people who catch coronavirus in this case end up recovering from the disease. So there's a population of people who are infected and then recover and are no longer infected that's not being accounted for here. And third, the rate that the disease spreads can be changed. The exponential growth assumes that people who already are infected with the disease have a relatively consistent level of contact with people who are susceptible to it. So if you're infected and you're not around other people, then the contact rate goes down and the spread of the disease slows. To address some of these issues, we're going to look at a second model called the SIR model. This model relies on integrating differential equations, so I'm not going to talk a ton about the actual math behind it. But in short, it divides the population into three groups. People who are susceptible to the disease, people who are infected, and people who have recovered and are immune. This model is a lot better than the exponential growth model, but it also does make certain assumptions and omit certain things. Namely, it doesn't account for death. The total population of people in this model doesn't change. What changes is the ratio of people who are infected to people who are susceptible to people who are immune. For the purposes of this example, I also make a few assumptions in this code, and we'll get to them as we go through the example. So focusing on the United States again, we're going to deal with the population of the United States, which is a little over 300 million people. And initially, we have one person infected and no one who has recovered from it. We want to look at how this disease progresses over about 500 days. And for this, I chose about 500 days because that's how long it's projected to take for us to get our first vaccine. We're going to use a contact rate of 0.25. So the contact rate is how many people in a period of time someone who's infected interacts with. And it's important to know that we don't have an actual number for contact rate for coronavirus. 0.2 is commonly used for something like the flu. So I'm going to run on the assumption that coronavirus is a little bit more contagious than the flu. Additionally, we set the recovery rate, and the recovery rate is one over the number of days it takes to become immune to the disease once you've been infected. This is also a bit of an assumption for two reasons. One, we think it takes about 14 days for you to stop showing symptoms and stop being feverish, but we don't have consistent data on whether or not that means that you can still infect other people. And two, we don't know how long immunity lasts. So we know that people who have caught the disease and have recovered from it are immune for some period of time, but we don't know if that's permanent or if, like the flu, they could be susceptible to another strain of coronavirus that's just as severe next year. The SIR model assumes that everyone who has recovered is immune permanently. So in this chunk of code, we're doing the integration over the different differential equations. I'm not going to explain that too much. And then we have our first model. As you can see, what essentially happens in this setup is that everyone gets it, and then everyone recovers. The thing to note here is that everyone gets it really fast. This is where things like flattening the curve come in, because if a million people have coronavirus, then that means that some fraction, around 20% of those people, are probably in the intensive care unit, and we don't have enough beds in the United States to hold them. This puts significant strain on the healthcare system and means that more people will end up dying simply because there aren't enough medical resources to take care of them. But what if we implement social distancing? What if you reduce the contact rate between people so that the disease has to spread more slowly? Well, that's the second graph. And the two things you can see here is that one, 
fewer people actually end up getting the disease. And two, the maximum number of people who are infected at any given time is much lower and much more spread out. This is flattening the curve. In this scenario, we're probably still putting a significant strain on our healthcare systems, but the concern around not having enough healthcare equipment or enough healthcare personnel to take care of everyone is a lot lower. So I hope this tutorial is helpful for you guys in understanding why flattening the curve is so important and how things like social distancing does that. I also hope it helps you understand how we can go from this being a not big deal like two weeks ago to having everything on lockdown two weeks later. For those of you who live in places where you're not already legally required to stay at home and minimize your outside contact with other people, I hope you take this into consideration when you think about going outside or going to parties or bars because you really shouldn't be right now. And it's not just for you. I think a lot of people, especially people my age, are not as concerned about something like coronavirus because we've heard that we're less likely to get it and less likely to get really sick from it. And first, some of the more recent reporting on the disease has actually shown that that might not be true. But second, a lot of us might be asymptomatic carriers. And if you live near someone who is immunocompromised or who is older and you don't know that, you might end up passing it to them and giving them a much more severe condition than you'd ever get. So protect yourself, protect your loved ones, protect your community, and spend the extra time that you might have if you're working from home, because I also know that some people can't work from home, maybe trying some new coding demos or picking up a new hobby instead of going to bars and restaurants outside. It's not the most fun, but it's worth the lives that it saves. If you like this video, you can let me know by smashing that like button and subscribing to my channel. You can also support me on Patreon. Thank you so much to all of my patrons. Otherwise, you can find me via my human name on the social medias, and I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.